what a beautiful and precious time of worship. Pray that your heart has been touched and that you have sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place uh, as we have come to this point in our service. Um, I'd like to offer uh, a prayer right now as we transition to the message. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we want to hear from you, Lord. We want your voice, your heart, your message to be what is celebrated in this place. So, Father, please, may I be a vessel in your hands, and may you speak now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I forget, Valeria, uh, I need to talk to you after church. But I said I have to talk to you. <laughs> okay, we'll figure it out. I know you've got Bible Bowl and so. Okay. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! Do you like the bow tie? Yeah. Ah, I, I kind of feel like the absent-minded professor. I don't know um, why I feel that way, but um, it's my only bow tie. So I decided, Forrest, I like it. John, yeah. Okay, I'm part of the team. Yeah. I know, just one of the nerds, it's all right. Um, I have been doing a series here recently on our identity as Adventists, our mission as Adventists, and our understanding of the three angels' message. So today I'm going to be talking about the second angel's message, and next week we're going to get into the third angel's message. Um, just to remind ourselves here at the beginning of 2024, um, what our core purpose is as a movement and as an organization and as believers in the unique Adventist message that we are a part of. If you're not a Seventh-day Adventist or if you're not familiar with some of this, you might be hearing things that you've, uh, you might be surprised at. You might be hearing things that you're not even really comfortable with. Um, I just pray that you will be open-minded and uh, that you would at least uh, ask questions or give an opportunity uh, to see what uh, is meant behind some of the things that I won't always have time to go into greater detail with. I'm also going to share a few stories from my own personal testimony um, that, that apply to the message today. And some of you have heard uh, more of my story, um, but I think it will be helpful also in examining and exploring the second angel's message um, but as we get into that, there will be a kid's quiz here in just a minute. I wanted to open up, though, with a couple of uh, passages from Spirit of Prophecy. Christ is coming the second time with power unto salvation. And to prepare human beings for this event, He has sent the first, second, and third angels' messages. These angels represent those who receive the truth and with power open the gospel to the world. The angels are us. That was my first message when we started this. We are the angels. Uh, it's interesting to read commentaries uh, that go over these passages, and I've shared some anecdotes along the way, but I've read some commentaries where very intelligent scholars have, have read the three angels' message, and they say, well, I guess in the last days, angels are going to get involved in the gospel. I guess that's what's going to happen. That apparently, human beings aren't sufficient enough, and God has to say, okay, angels, you got to get in there and bail them out because they're not doing a good job. We would, we would differ with that. We would say, no, we are those angels. We are the messengers. We are the chosen ones that God has asked in the last days to embrace these messages, the message of truth, and with power, not timidity, not subtlety, but with boldness, share this gospel truth to the world. In another place, she says, we are to give the world a manifestation of the pure, noble, holy principles that are to distinguish the people of God from the world. Okay, they're, they're, and it's not to distinguish for distinguishing sake. But by the natural uh, you know, obedience and embracement of the truth of the gospel and the character of God and obeying His will for our lives, including His law, we will differ than the world. And that's only natural. We are going to look different because the world doesn't do the same things that we do. She goes on to say, instead of the people of God becoming less and less definitely distinguished from those who do not keep the seventh-day Sabbath, they are to make the observance of the Sabbath so prominent that the world cannot fail to recognize them as Seventh-day Adventists. So here's my first story. In uh, roughly the fall, I don't remember exactly, um, of, 2000, of the year 2000, um, my wife and I, well, actually it was in the summer of 2000, 
my wife and I began keeping the Sabbath for the first time as Seventh-day observers. We had been Pentecostal, and for us, Sunday was our Sabbath, although it means something very different in that context. But we had been studying, we had been uh, learning new things, and we had made the decision as a family that we were going to keep the Sabbath. And so around summertime, I think it was June-ish of, um, of the year uh, 2000, we began keeping the Sabbath. Now, um, Andre was baptized this last week. Are you here, Andre? Yeah. Remember him saying that he worked at Costco? You remember every word of his testimony, don't you? It was just powerful and I, too, worked at Costco, and some of you who've heard my story remember this. I began keeping the Sabbath while I was working at Costco, okay? And I love Costco. Bulk is great, wholesale, yeah, give me that toilet paper, it lasts forever, okay? We love it, okay? Um, But at Costco, it's a high-demand, you know, uh, business, and nobody uh, really gets Saturdays off. But I had come to the conviction that I I wanted to keep the Sabbath. And I'm not going to go into all the details uh, to to illustrate this point in this story. But the time came when I decided to keep the Sabbath, and it was a big problem at Costco. So they brought me into the manager's office, and I'm sitting there, and he pulls out my my application. I've been working there about a year and a half or so. And and he pulls out my application. He says, here, right here, it says you would work every day. Because it asks you on the application, what days are you available to work? And I had written every day, and he says, but you've said, why are you telling me now? And, and I said, well, things change. I've, I've decided to, to be a, a Sabbath keeper. And he says, okay. And by the way, I didn't know anything about religious liberty at this time. I didn't know a thing that I could kind of say, well, you have to let me do it. It's my personal conviction. Yeah, watch out. I'm going to lawyer up if you say anything, right? Uh, I didn't know anything about that. Not that we should do that. I'm just, I'm just saying. But I, I'm, just a, I'm just kind of a naive first-time person at this. And he says, all right, I'll tell you what. I will allow you to keep uh, having Saturdays off except for two times a year. And if any of you have ever worked in retail or or wholesale, that's called inventory. And at Costco, at least in my context, nobody got inventory off. There was a manager who worked at Costco for 40 years. I I, I worked with his name as Donnie. He was a manager. He, He didn't work, excuse me, he hadn't worked there for 40 years. He was having his 40th anniversary, 40th wedding anniversary that happened to fall on an inventory weekend. And they said, sorry, you will be at work on your 40th wedding anniversary. That's how, that's how definite they were about you. Nobody gets inventory off. Did I make that clear? Have I said that? You got that part? All right. So anyways, he said, I can't let you have inventory off. Now, the winter inventory, they only did it twice a year, really wasn't a problem because it started Saturday night and the sun would set up in the Northwest. The sun would set at five o'clock or so and inventory didn't start till six. So the winter inventory wasn't a problem, but the summer inventory was. And so I said to him, and it was coming up. Again, this is, I just kept been keeping the Sabbath for maybe a month. And the summer inventory was like, you know, the middle, middle of summer. And I said, I'm sorry. I, and I actually said this. I said, I know you might have to fire me. I, and I apologize that I, and, and I understand if you have to fire me. And he's like, oh, no, no, we're not going to do that. He says, here's what we're going to do. The winter inventory is not a problem. For the summer inventory, um, we're going to make this one exception for you. You be in this building 15 minutes after sundown. You be in here, you clock in 15 minutes after sundown, and we'll, we'll accept that. I don't remember if there was an ultimatum. I don't remember if there was an or else or not. I was just panicking. My heart was racing. I don't know what's going on. I'm, think- I'm barely married, and I'm thinking I'm losing a job. And by the way, Costco's a good place to work. They pay good. The environment's good. Benefits are good. You don't want to lose a job if you're, uh, at least it was for me. I, you know, a lot of people, anyways do very well at Costco. I'm wandering a bit here, but I'm trying to get to my point. So anyway, so that inventory comes up. And actually, the individual that introduced me to the Seventh-day Adventist Church actually was my boss at Costco. He was the the maintenance director, and because he had a little bit of a a smaller department, he could kind of manage things uniquely, so he was already giving me the Sabbath off. But anyway, so we both had this deal that we were able to come in 15 minutes after sundown for that inventory that summer. So we go to work together. Um, He picked me up, and we drive to Costco, and we're sitting in his pickup waiting for sundown. And we're talking. We're praying together. I think we even sang a hymn. It was kind of embarrassing to seem. Uh, But we were, you know, really trying. He was recently a, a, a recent Adventist as well. He had been Baptist, he'd married a Catholic, but they had joined the church together. So 
Um, we are sitting in the truck, sun goes down, okay, we know by the, the time frame and everything. 15 minutes later, we walk into the building. Now, if you're familiar with Costco, you know where the receiving dock is? It's at the end of the building, okay? And that's where employees enter the building, is at the, the end of the building. But where you clock in is at the front of the building. So we, we walk in the door, okay, now inventory's been going on for about two hours. And the parking lot is full with all the employees' vehicles, and they've been in there working like crazy, right? So we walk in, and we have to walk from the back of the store down the main aisle all the way to the front. You, you, you picture in this with me? We walk in the door, and they had music going on the speakers. They did. But it felt like everything went silent. Every single employee that saw us stopped what they were doing and gawked. The forklift drivers stopped and looked. I mean, everyone who saw us, because again, this is a big deal. They're like, what are you doing? How is it that you're, you're, you're coming in late? Don't you know you're going to get fired? I mean, they don't know all of what's going on, but they, the whole building just stands still. And I, again, my heart's racing, and I'm just kind of... Now, one, an interesting thing happened. Ron's brother-in-law, his name was Tim, uh, worked at Costco as well, and he was a, he was a Catholic, just happened to be, and as we're walking down one of the aisles, we're getting close to the front where it's time to check in, and uh, Tim jumps out of the aisle. He did. He jumped out of the aisle right in front of us, and he pointed his finger, and he goes, you guys are fools. Don't you know that the Catholic Church changed the Sabbath and what you're doing is a mockery. You've all been there. <laughs> and uh, I was kind of letting Ron be my, my guard, I guess you could say. And Ron just says, well, we don't follow the Catholic Church. We follow the Bible. And we walked around. We punched in. My point is this. We did not run into that building waving flags. Hey, everybody, guess what? We are not having to come in because we're Adventists keeping the Sabbath and you all had to work and we're going to heaven and I'm not sure about you. We're just doing fine, okay? That's not what this means. But what this means is as we embrace the truth and we live it out in our lives, it will stick out, when you in your job, when you in your school, when you in your family, hey, we want to go do this, we want to do this, you say, well, actually, my convictions are different than yours. I observe a day of worship because of what God has done for me as my creator and my redeemer. You don't have to poke people in the eye. You don't have to bash them over the head with your Bibles, but you stand for your convictions. You will be noticed. You will be you will stand out. And the Bible says in the last days, there will be a people who observing the Sabbath and through living the gospel truth in their hearts and lives will distinguish themselves from the people of the earth, the other people of the earth. Now, um, there's a couple of corollaries I want to share with you on this. Um, and I, I will start uh, preaching here in a minute. I'm not there yet. Um, on an inverse of that story, Shortly after that, um, in the fall of 2001, I began going to Walla Walla, it was Walla Walla College at the time. I still can't get my brain to say Walla Walla University, even though it's been university for like 20 years now. Uh, Walla Walla. I go to Walla Walla, and I'm meeting some friends, and meeting people, and one of my friends is trying to get a job. And he says, you know, an interesting thing, and he was in the theology department like I was, studying to become a pastor, and he says, an interesting thing happened to me. I went to Albertsons to try to get a job. And on the application, it, it asked the question, and, and I had to write, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, so I sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, I'm not available to work. And the HR director took that application from me and looked at it and said, I don't understand. We employ a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, and they don't have a problem working on Saturdays. Now that's not, that, that's the opposite of this. Okay? That is not the, the, the message and the lifestyle and the, the, the angel's message that we are to embrace in the last days. Um, uh, we are to stand for the truths of God. And of course, you know, we can't control what other people 
say about themselves or what they do, but if we are embracing the identity and the calling and the message of the three angels' message, we will make this a priority in our lives because of its critical, critical nature. Uh, I could uh, share a few other anecdotes, but I, I want to move on here. Here's the second angel's message. Another angel, a second one followed, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> you know, I've read Revelation when I was uh, a Christian of a different stripe, and, and I would put this passage kind of like in Daniel 11 and those other ones, like, oh, okay, Babylon, bad, immorality, don't have anything to do with that. It didn't really make any sense to me. These messages are meant to be mined. These messages are meant to be digested. This is not eating cake, all right? This is, this is brand meal, brand muffins, all right? This takes digestion. This takes study. This takes research and application of other passages of the Bible to understand. And the journey is profitable and worth it. And that's what we're going to do just uh, for a few minutes today. We can't do it all, um, but we're going to study what this means, and I'm going to share with you why it is so pivotal to our identity and our mission here in the last days. So all that, and we do have some interactive time for young people today. So I'd like to have maybe one more help out. Um, some of my regulars aren't here. Oh, Owen, look at that. Thank you, brother. So, back, I uh, just want to back up. It calls it Babylon the Great, right? That phrase is used another time. It's in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. Who was the king uh, in most of the book of Daniel? What was his name? Who was the king of Babylon that is referred to in the book of Daniel? What was his name? Okay, guys. Oh, I see some young men over here, and did you have some over here? Let's let, it uh, looks like Eric's hand is being waved for him. And uh, Sebastian. So, Eric? Nebuchadnezzar. All right, that's one idea. And what about over here? Seb Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, you guys got it. One of my favorite characters of the Bible. So complex, so unique. He was the king of Babylon in Daniel's day. Okay, number two. The Tower of Blank in Genesis is also connected with Babylon. What's that tower called? The Tower of, I see Julian and Ryden over here. Good to have you, Ryden. Right, and give us, uh, give us your answer. The Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. Julian, did you want to say it? Same. Same. Tower of same. That's correct. You got it. <laughs> yeah, Tower of Babel. Now, etymologically, I mean, the word itself is related. They are in the same place. Babylon in the uh, Akkadian language means gate of the gods. In the Hebrew language, uh, it means uh, uh, confusion. But they are based on the same root uh, uh, word, and uh, they are the same idea biblically. Early Christians sometimes use the term Babylon to refer to this city that starts with an R. What city, starting with an R, did early Christians use the term Babylon to refer to? Try not to make this too hard. What other city could that be a reference to? Anyone? Mike, Dylan, you're pointing at someone? You're pointing at Geo? Come on now. Oh, over here? Rome. Okay. Rome. In the early Christian era, there was no city of Babylon. It, it had been destroyed. So in the early Christian texts, because they were afraid of persecution, they would refer to Rome as Babylon. And you see evidence of that even in 1 Peter 5.13. Greet all those who are in Babylon. He's probably referring to Rome, and other early Christian writers regularly refer to the Roman Empire as Babylon. Very interesting. So this all plays in. Now, just a kind of end here. It says, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Uh, uh, who else fell in the Bible? Who fell from heaven? Who fell from heaven? Let's raise your hand. Geo? The three angels. The three the angels did come from heaven, but who fell from heaven? Who was that bad angel that fell from heaven? All right, we have Abel. Let's give Abel a shot. Lucifer. Lucifer. So, bad angel fell. And Isaiah literally says, how thou art fallen from heaven. 
uh, Lucifer, son of the dawn. Okay, what about in the garden? Did anyone fall in the garden? Who fell in the garden? All right, Gio. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. We refer to it as the fall, don't we? You know, it was called, we call it the fall. All right, this one we need some advanced students for. The God of the Philistines also fell. Do you remember his name? We might need some uh, advanced students here. I see A.B. Uh, let's give A.B. a shot. You know, all these regional uh, powers had their gods. There was Chemosh of the uh, Moabites. Uh, there was Ashtaroth of the, uh, of the Sidon, Sidonians, I guess. A.B., who, what is the name of the God of the Philistines? <laughs> I don't think it's giggle. No. Um, I'm Goliath? It's not Abel either. It, it, Goliath? It's not Goliath. Wait, he was have, the big guy. I have another one. Okay, one more chance. Okay. Oh, I forgot how to pronounce it. Dagon? Dagon! Dagon! Now, the reason I mentioned Dagon is because if you remember the story, the Philistines steal the ark. And they put it in the temple of their god, Dagon. They wake up the next morning, and Dagon is fallen on his face. They pick up Dagon, they set him back up, and they come back the next morning, and he was fallen again. And this time his head had broken off, and his arms had broken off, and it's just his torso. So Dagon, Dagon fell twice. Interesting. All right, last one. How many of you know this verse? Raise your hand. For blank have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right over here. For all. For all. The concept of the fall is something consistent to everyone who is bound up in sin. We have all fallen. Thank you, guys. Owen, Toby, appreciate your help. This is a concept. To be fallen is to be sinful. To be fallen is to have had a time of relationship with God, but you have now rejected God and you now live in a sinful state. That is what fallen means in the Bible. And it can mean other things as well. It is also the literal, you know, Babylon fell. The Tower of Babel literally fell. But we're talking about a spiritual fall of greater significance than just, than just the city. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place. This is the first letter to the a church in Ephesus. Remember from where you have fallen. All of us have fallen, but Babylon has fallen twice. So we're going to talk about that. Again, just to summarize the first angel's message, there's different ways. You can put it in your own words as well. But essentially, I would submit to you that the first angel's message is basically hold fast to God, understand that the Sabbath is a sign of your devotion and love to God. Judgment is here and let no man or idea keep you from entering the ark of safety in Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay? And, and last week I went into why all of those elements are in the first angel's message and are there for the Bible student to understand. But now we want to get into the second angel's message. Let's just remind ourselves, it's a very simple statement. Another angel, a second one followed, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. It's one verse. But yet built into this verse is an enormous history and prophetic scriptural pattern and meaning. And we're just going to touch the, ba touch the surface of much of it, but try to get to the core of what the second angel's message is, because this is our message, friends. This is our message. Again, I just want to go back to what I said in the very first week. I made three points. The first point I made was over here. You can be a Christian and have the assurance of salvation without understanding the three angels' message. You can. Okay? The second, the second point I made, I made it right over here. And I said, you can be a Sabbath-keeping Christian, loving the law of God, and not understand the three angels' message and have the assurance of salvation. But I made the third point right about here. You cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist without understanding, embracing, 
and living the three angels' message. Okay? Now, you don't have to choose. It's your choice. No one's forcing you to choose to identify with the Seventh-day Adventist church movement. But if your heart has been moved and you're motivated to it, you need to understand to at least a sufficient degree why these messages are so pivotal to us believers in these messages in the last days. So that's why I say it. We need to know what this is. So let's just get into it briefly. Notice, first of all, no command is given. There's no instructions given. Unlike the first angel's message, which is fear the Lord, give Him glory, worship Him. There's all these contexts saying this is what you need to do. This is what you need to understand. This is the God you need to worship. No such instruction is given. It's simply a warning. It's simply a reminder. Don't forget the second message of the, uh, of the, of the uh, second angel. Of the, of the three angels, it's just don't forget, be aware, be reminded, I'm warning you, Babylon is fallen, and you need to know who Babylon is, and you need to be able to share with the world why it's important to know that there's no virtue, no virtue, any, any redeemable value at all in Babylon. Now, later on in Revelation, there, and, and again, as John begins to develop the three angels' messages, you will see the call to come out of Babylon. And that is, that is inferred in this, but here initially, at least, it's simply a warning. It's simply an alert. Babylon is fallen, fallen, twice fallen. Now, we can get into a lot of different theories about why it's repeated, Okay? But in general, it's accepted among Bible theologians and scholars that the repetition of a word is usually emphasis. It's emphasis. So when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say to you, he's emphasizing. Don't miss this. This is critical. You've got to understand this. When the angels cry out in Isaiah 6, holy, 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 it is a profound emphasis that they're making. Most of the time in the Bible, repeating a word is for emphasis. Now, it can mean other things. It can mean both literally fallen and spiritually fallen, and there's been lots of sermons and and studies that suggest other things, but I think it is critically uh, relevant to understand that what God is saying here is that Babylon, everyone has fallen once. We're all fallen But the Bible says there is a second fall that is of such great impact that it is of no redemption. How many of you, any of you parents, or maybe even in your Bible classes, or Dean Mark in in your Bible classes, have you ever had a student say, should we pray for the devil? Should we pray for the, maybe we can, if we all band together and really pray, maybe the devil can be redeemed. Has that ever crossed your mind? I know you want to talk, but (laughs) the Bible makes it clear that the fall of Lucifer is of that emphasized double fall, that there is no redemption. Now, notice what, I I don't have it on the screen, I'm just going to read, listen to what Peter says here, Uh, Peter, uh, 2 Peter here has a lot of information about last day stuff and false prophets, uh, 2 Peter 2, he says false prophets and the people that are coming among you, they are going to introduce destructive heresies, they're going to deny the master, he goes on to describe the evil that they'll do, okay, in in a lot of detail, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this fast, but I want you to hear what he says here, verse 17 of 2 Peter 2, these are springs without water, mist driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved, speaking out arrogant words of vanity. Oh wait, before that, he actually says, these are, this is verse 12, these are like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct, to be captured and killed. Notice the language he's using. There's no redemption here. They have fallen with such emphasis that redemption, they've gone beyond the point of probation, okay? But he goes on to say, speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires and sensuality. He mentions sensual uh, immorality and sensuality a lot in this, which um, the second angel also mentions. Those who are barely escape are from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he's enslaved. Now here's the, the pertinent part. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord, okay, so they've, they've been fallen, but now they've been redeemed. 
but they then again become entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened according to the true proverb, a dog has returned to its vomit. Now, I don't want to get into the whole debate of once saved, always saved, and where do we point past the point of no return. However, it's clear biblically that there does come a point where if we've rejected Christ to such a degree, we can become irredeemable. And that is what has happened with Babylon. Irredeemable. Now, here's... Okay, let me, let me move on, because this, this will tie in here. So there are three main uh, uh, applications to what Babylon is in the Bible. Babel. And I'm going to do these briefly, because I know that you know, you're already getting a full meal here, and you've got to stop at some point, or else it gets overloaded. So I'm going to do these briefly, but I want you to understand and do some, own, some of your own Bible study as well. What the issue was at Babel and why Babel is included in this concept of Babylon, at the Tower of Babel, the people rejected the sign of God's covenant, which was the rainbow. They rejected the, the rainbow. Every time they saw the rainbow, it was to remind them of God's promise that I will not bring a flood to destroy the earth again. But they rejected that. They said, we don't accept your sign. We are going to build our own pattern of salvation. We, by the way, when Babel was being built, the ark was probably still visible. They probably sent children on school trips. Let's go look at old Noah's ark and be reminded of all that. that I mean, really, the ark was probably still there. But they rejected God's provision of salvation. God, we don't want to have anything to do with the ark. We don't want to have anything to do with the sign of His covenant. All right? We are going to build our own edifice of salvation in rebellion and rejection of God. They rejected the word of God through Noah, and they rejected the sign of the covenant. That's Babel. They rejected the word of God, and they rejected the sign of His covenant, the rainbow. Then you come to Babylon. Babylon is the primary, obviously, connection with Revelation. It was the literal city. Now, what? again, you can get into a lot of things of all the experiences that happened in, to the people of God in Babylon, but to, su- to summarize it, Babylon rejected the Word of God through Daniel and the Word of God through the visions and dreams and prophecies that He had given them over years trying to redeem them, and they corrupted the law of God. That was what Babylon did. They corrupted the law of God. In Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar tries to force the people of God to violate God's law. He says, you will bow to this idol or you're out of here. And the three Hebrews said, well, we're going to stand for God. It doesn't matter what you do with us. Our God is able to save us. But he he tried to force them to uh, violate God's law. In Daniel chapter 6, a different king, but still in Babylon, tries to uh, prevent the people of God from following God's law. Do you notice the difference? In Daniel chapter 3, they try to force him, force the the people of God to violate God's law. In Daniel chapter 6, they try to prevent God's people from keeping His law. The people that hated Daniel said the only thing we're going to be able to find against him is in the law of his God. So they passed a law saying you can't pray to the true God. You can only pray to the king. You cannot keep your covenant to God. You must do what we say. And Daniel said, I'd rather pray to my God. I'm not going to break the law. The, the, uh, the, the aura, the idea, uh, among other things, with Babylon was the corruption of the law of God. And it's in Daniel chapter 7 when the Antichrist, through the uh, power of the little horn, tries to change times and laws. In Daniel 7.25. Babylon rejected the Word of God and tried to corrupt the law. I'm summarizing here. And then you come to Rome. What is it that Rome did? Rome literally rejected the Word of God. The Word of God made flesh. Rome crucified Jesus, and Rome partnered with the people of God in the destruction of the Son of God. Remember when Jesus was on trial and Pilate's trying to let him go and, and, and they say, we, the, the Jewish leaders said, we have no God except Caesar, or no king, excuse me, let's get it accurate. We have no king except Caesar. 
And then in Luke 23, verse 12, it says, On that day Herod and Pilate became friends, for previously they had been enemies. So in Rome, they reject literally the Word of God, and there's a partnership between the rebellious people of God and pagan people in the destruction. That's Babylon. Now, what I wanted to say in connection to this, there's more to it than this. There's, there's more. One of the things that distinguishes the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of prophecy from most of the other Christian world, Catholic and Protestant, and I've had long talks with my family about this, in most Catholic and Protestant understanding of the future, at least in their theology, may not practically among their people, but in their theology, they believe it's their destiny to take over this world. Okay, do you understand that? So in evangelical circles, they're even talking about it now. Mark, you prayed during your prayer for our political leaders, and, and uh, there's all kinds of talks right now about who's going to get the evangelical vote, right? Who's going to get the evangelical? How can we appeal to the evangelicals? And really, what in, in, in many Christian settings, the evangelicals believe it's their destiny not to save people. They want to save people as well, but they think they need to take over the government. They want to appoint Christian judges and Christian governors and Christian presidents. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having good leadership, but their understanding is very different than ours. They think that their destiny is to one day ultimately take over through Christian principles the governments and institutions and corporations of the world. And in so doing, they'll make earth ready for Jesus to come. Adventists, in our understanding of prophecy, we believe this world is passing away. That yes, we should have good leaders and there's nothing wrong for voting for moral people and wanting quality leadership, but whatever we do, that's a temporary band-aid because this world is passing away. Our job is to save people and make them part of the new kingdom. I have a relative who I love desperately, but I just want you to hear and understand some of the different mindsets out there. Deeply religious, committed Christian individual. But he, had, he made this statement to me once. I can't wait till we get to the millennium when we as Christians get to rule over all those gays and Muslims and atheists and we get to be in charge instead of them. I love him. To me, that is horrendous. To me, that is not our future. Is that heaven to you? But to a good portion of both Protestant and Catholic mindset, that is what their destiny is. And what the second angel message tells us is this world, Babel, who was the whole earth. It says the whole earth spoke one language and they gathered together on the plain of Shinar. That was the whole world. Babylon ruled its world as far as its boundaries understood. Rome ruled its world as far as its boundaries understood. And the whole world is fallen and is irredeemable. We can pray for it. We can love it. We can try to uh, uh, sustain good things. But ultimately, we realize this world is passing away, and the only world that matters is the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. That is the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. All the world is affected. It's not local or regional. And then, again... She who made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Actually, the King James uses the word fornication instead of immorality, and that's probably more accurate because this is the Greek word porneia. It means sexual immorality. If I lie, that's immoral, but that's not porneia. All right, if I steal your car, well, that's immoral, but that's not what porneia means. Porneia means sexual immorality. immorality. It means fornication, Okay. And, and again, th there is a spiritual fornication where you've made a commitment to God and yet you, you uh, have affairs with your other gods on the side, all right? That's spiritual fornication. But I'll tell you this, whenever there is spiritual fornication, it always leads to physical fornication as well. Always. 
There, so I don't think there's any point in trying to, do, to separate them. What is our world obsessed with right now? Sexual politics. It is not just, here's what I'm trying to get at. Some commentators want to lean all the way on the spiritual. Say, oh, all this is talking about is worshiping the wrong gods and not worshiping the true God. And that's part of it. Others want to go totally to the physical and say, oh, this is talking about all the, the sexual improprieties and all the, the uh, things going on. But it's both. It's both. And when you understand the, the punishment and the penalty of how God has, has uh, uh, done things in the past, like with Sodom and Gomorrah, there is a reality of when you take yourself away from fidelity to God, ultimately your sinful desires take over you and you give yourself, you give heed to your sexual improprieties as well. So you can get more into why this is the identifying mark of Babel, Babylon, Rome, and our world today. But God is saying, just look around. Babylon is fallen. And we need to make sure that people can know that there is another kingdom that they can be a part of. I've been keeping the Sabbath for about three months, I would guess. Now we're in the fall of the year 2000. To their credit, um, my wife and I were very involved in our church. We weren't just kind of uh, in the shadows or on the side. She was a music leader, you know, she you know, kind of enjoys music. Uh, I was in youth leadership. We were very visibly involved in our Pentecostal church. And when we came under a new conviction and we were trying to struggle with what direction to take, we came to the, you know, conviction we were going to keep the Sabbath and we were going to move in a, in a new direction. So to their credit, my family said, we, we feel that this is too far. You don't want to know one of the things that drove our family crazier than almost anything? when we said we were going to become vegetarians. I'm telling you, that was beyond the pale for some of them. You want to keep a different day? It's weird, but we get it. But you're not going to eat meat anymore? Oh, my goodness. There were other things that, that happened along the way, too. But um, friends and family began to have interventions on our behalf. Have you ever had an intervention? And all kinds of things and scenarios happen, and pastors, former pastors were reaching out to us, what's going on, well, you know, and we would share our story. Well, in about October, November of 2000, I get a phone call from a former youth pastor of mine, a guy I love to death, his name's Steve Moore, and he'd been a great mentor to me when I'd been a teenager, and uh, I just love Steve. Hadn't talked to him in a couple years, though, so out of the blue, Steve calls me, Dave, let's go to lunch. Now, what do you think I'm thinking? All right, Steve. I'm ready for this. So we go to Red Robin. You love Red Robin? Yeah? Yum. <laughs> Good fries. I think, I don't remember Gina, I think I was trying to be a vegetarian at this time. I think. It's hard to be a vegetarian at Red Robin. You know, this is 25, 20 some years ago, by the way. There wasn't the fake meat thing all over the place. So Steve and I go to lunch at Red Robin. And I probably ordered a salad. And uh, I think that drove him nuts. Anyways, and he begins to say, and I say, Steve, I know what this is about. And he says, yeah, your, your parents reached out to me and I thought I'd give you a call and just, let's talk. And so I gave him the whole spiel. We've been studying. We just see things a little different now. We want to follow our convictions. And this is the direction we're going. And we went back and forth a little bit. To his credit, uh, again, this is the Pentecostal um, church, Pentecostal movement, Steve said, look, there's a lot of stuff about Pentecostalism. I'm still struggling. I don't know about this whole speaking in tongues thing, getting slain in the Spirit, laughing in the Spirit, dancing in the Spirit. I, yeah, I don't know. We can, that may not be quite what the Bible has for us. And so I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm glad you're being honest about that. Um, but as the uh, conversation progresses, um, and, and he was talking, and I, I always thought hellfire was an easy one. And I would talk, and I said, I just don't see how God, a loving God, would plunge someone into eternal torment for one brief lifetime of sin. That's just, that doesn't match up with the character of God. And we went into that, and um, um, as we were getting toward the end of the meal, though, I've forgotten a lot about this meeting, but I've never forgotten this. You know, you come to a point in a conversation where neither of you are going to win. Any of that? This happens all the time with other people. <laughs> Steve very demonstrably stops, and he pushes his plate of food away from him on the table. 
And I don't like being pointed at, <laughs> but he pointed at me. And he said, Dave, are you telling me I'm in Babylon? How would you answer? How would you answer? What would you say? I knew nothing of Adventist culture or anything at this time. I didn't know what a haystack was. I didn't know about conferences and academies. I knew nothing. I was just studying through a series of Bible studies the, the beliefs. And he pointed at me. Now, unbeknownst to me, he had been getting ready for this meeting. He'd been watching 3ABN. And he was a, you know, an ordained minister. He would studied a little bit about wacko groups like Adventist. He, he was, but he pointed at me. Am I in Babylon, Dave? And what he was saying, it wasn't an open-ended question like, I just want to know what you think, or, or how, how could I work this out with you? What he was saying is, are you saying I'm going to hell? That's what he meant. That is exactly what he meant. Are you saying I'm lost? Are you saying I am part of this fallen, fallen group? Am I in Babylon? You know, hindsight being what it was, what it is, I would have answered differently. I would have. But I do believe what I answered was what the Lord wanted me to say. In more years of wisdom, I would have said, you know, that is not my judgment to make for you. Your relationship with the Lord is between you and the Lord. I'm following my own convictions, and my convictions have led me to where I'm going with my life. That is for you to decide between you and the Lord. That's what I would have said. That's what I should have said. But I didn't. I did the Nehemiah prayer, Lord, save me. I said, Steve, I love you. But I have to tell you, if you believe that the law of God has been done away with, if you believe the lie of a secret rapture that gives people false understanding of the truth of Jesus Christ, if you believe that a loving God would plunge people into eternal hell for the sins of one brief lifetime, if you believe it's the destiny, again, this is big in the Pentecostal world, if you believe it's the destiny of believers to rule over the wicked, then yes. I do believe you're in Babylon. That's what I said. We shook hands. The meal ended. And we agreed to disagree. I've seen him a few times. We're not angry with each other. But that's how I answered. It's something that we need to talk about in our own hearts, in our own minds, though, when it comes to our mission as a people. Do we understand what it means that Babylon has fallen and that that's part of our gospel message in the last days? The first angel's message answers the question, of am I in Babylon? The first angel's message is are you fearing God? Which in virtually every biblical context means are you obeying? Are you obeying the Lord? Are you giving glory to Him in the context of the truth of His character? And are you worshiping Him in the way in which the sign of His covenant has been given? I gave them my Sabbaths that they would be a sign between me and them throughout their generations that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. If you reject the sign, it is the Tower of Babel. Are you keeping the law of God? Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth. 
Or are you allowing the theology of the corruption of the law of God in your spiritual life? The first angel's message tells us if we're in Babylon or not. And the third angel's message tells us what to do if we discover that we are in Babylon. These are not disparate messages. They go hand in hand. They are meant to be understood sequentially. They tell a story and a pattern of redemption and of Jesus Christ's ability to save in the crazy and reckless days in which we live. That is the calling and privilege of the Seventh-day Adventist movement in the last days. To help yourself know where you stand with God and to embrace a lifestyle and a community and a message that invites others to also ask themselves the question, am I right with God? Am I really following the Bible? Am I really understanding His grace and power? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the eternal gospel that is in all three of the angels' messages. I realize I tried to cover a lot there and give some stories and anecdotes. Again, this is meant to be something that you embrace and study and cherish and digest in in more than just one sermon. But wait until we get to next week when I get to talk about the third angel's message. And then let's see what we can find from there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I realize, Lord, you have so much greater depth and so much greater power in, in what these messages stand for. And it was your plan, Father, to enshrine these in Scripture as a post, as a holding post and a lynch post for our faith in the last days. That as we study all of the scriptures together, as we see Jesus highlighted throughout all of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, it gives uh, strength and body to our understanding of what these messages are for us in the last days. Lord, we want to be able to help people know who you truly are and to have confidence and courage in your coming kingdom and the power of your salvation and not to be distracted by the twisting falsehoods that the devil has thrown all over our world. So, Father, help us in this endeavor. Help us individually, Lord. Help us corporately as a body. Embrace and understand what our message and mission is in these days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.